Dr. Blossom Secrets yeah. and I wanted to talk to you specifically about EYFS so thank you for agreeing to talk to me about EYFS. Anytime. Um, so I thought it'd be really helpful for everyone to start off with if you could sort of tell us your journey into teaching and then what led you to the decision to leave in the first place just so they got a big background of you. Yeah I mean I can kind of start a really long way back because I knew I wanted to be involved in teaching or education for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started by that kind of interest beginning by doing children's Muay Thai boxing lessons. Um, so I'd done Muay Thai for a long while, a good few years, and I wasn't fantastic at it, but I was good enough that I could teach children, and that was really the part of it that I enjoyed more, more so than my actual own training or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the more that I saw the development of the children in there, the more I got interested in that. This is while I was still at school myself, um, in secondary school. So I kind of decided that this was an area I had an interest in. So I started using my free periods in later GCSE and in A-level to go and volunteer at a primary school. And I did sort of reading with children and a lot of work with mainly year one and reception children. Um, initially, when I went to do a degree, I had chosen to do it in education. And I switched it just before starting because I just had this sort of real urge to do English literature. Mm -hmm. It's something that I'm really passionate about. I read an incredible amount really. It's slightly ridiculous at times. That's kind of all I end up doing. So um, go on, how much do you read? Uh, so last year I did 149 books. Um, you are sort of working mainly as well, novels right? and I am yeah, working. Yeah, yeah uh, for you. So hopefully I'm working enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's <laughs> check that one. Yeah, um, but I do read alongside. I'm, I'm also doing a master's alongside that as well, which involves quite a lot of reading and mm -hmm. kind of encourages it. So I, I ended up doing a degree in English literature, but even during that, I was doing little projects about how children transition first from nursery into school and then from year six into secondary school. So I kind of had done projects alongside English literature still, with always with the view that I was eventually going to come back and do primary education and that that's where I was going, um, which I then did uh, at Birmingham. I did a PGC, uh, but did it up to level seven because I knew I wanted to move into doing a master's anyway. Right. Um, so I'd kind of done a lot of action research and then I've ended up in teaching for a few a few years now. Um, I think it's about nine years ago that I actually qualified. Um, and the, you asked about the reason that I left and it's it's not exactly one single reason. It's more that the workload became massive. Yeah. There was a huge element involved in it. Mm -hmm. But that never really bothered me until I started having... So I should probably just mention this in advance. I know you already know, but yeah, yeah. Um, I do already have epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And things like working massive amounts of hours, yeah. sort of over 50 hours, 60 hours a week, just proved too much. And I started having more and more seizures. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how resilient children are mm -hmm. for things like that. I've never known any child be bothered or concerned about it. They just do what they need to do. They'll take mm -hmm. a little card to the head and deal with it. But having more of them means having like blacks, black spots in your memory and sort yeah. of parts that you can't really bring back and I didn't feel like I could really continue in that kind of workload without making myself incredibly unwell oh, yeah. and I think unless I could find a better balance than that it would have been really difficult for me to stay in, ed in working in education at that point which is mm -hmm. kind of devastating because it's all I'd ever really wanted to do mm -hmm. um, but moving to what I currently do which is obviously working for Classroom Secrets means that I can kind of stay working within education mm -hmm. and then alongside it, even even working full time now while doing a master's and currently working on a thesis towards a doctorate level study, mm -hmm. I still have more free time than I did when I was teaching and I'm still healthier yeah. and having fewer seizures. It's, That's good. It's a little bit of a worry for teachers, I suppose, but... Probably a lot of a worry. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, okay. So... I wanted to talk to you about EYFS. So why are you so passionate about EYFS as opposed to the other year groups? I think partially because it was something where when I was first looking into different schools and looking back at primary schools, it was an area that I kind of just ended up in. And when I was looking at doing a study on transitions, I expected to do mainly year six to mm -hmm. secondary, but I actually found it far more interesting watching that change from nursery into reception and into year one, that kind of transition from play-based mm -hmm. and more into that formal instruction and formal learning. 
And I always expected that that's the area I would end up teaching in and instead ended up teaching more in Key Stage 2, in Year 4, in Year 5 and Year 6 because I think there's a, maybe, maybe I'm completely wrong about this, but it's in my own experience, the minute you start at a school, they kind of have an anticipation that male teachers are not necessarily going to be that keen to no, be in I Year agree. 1 and reception. I agree with that. Which actually I was, um, but it was only further down that I ended up going back to it and by that point I'd done four, four years, something like that, of Key Stage 2 and I'd almost de-skilled myself yeah so when moving back to year one I was really keen to get back to a continuous provision approach mm -hmm. and I started doing more research and I was just amazed watching I watched a really great reception teacher who's very very experienced I was amazed watching just how confident she was with her own children who were going to be moving into my class mm. how confident she was in not having to do things that were formalized in not having to have really standardized learning experiences mm. and set lessons and she just had this absolute faith that because she'd created the perfect provision mm -hmm. and because she'd put brilliant enhancements in place and because she just knew her children so well, mm. it was just really interesting to see that level of confidence. But also just from seeing those children then myself move into my class, seeing how confident the children were themselves and seeing how much passion and how much enjoyment they had in their school experience. I don't know how much you get that in other year groups compared to early years, how much you get that just kind of unbridled joy where a child comes in and feels that they're playing. They almost yeah. don't even realise that they are learning. It's not, you don't need a learning objective or anything like that, which I you know is kind of phased out a little bit somewhat now in places, but yeah. it's just never needed. There's no structure and yet they're still learning everything. Yeah, I feel, um, so obviously I did secondary education first and then I kind yeah. of fell into primary and I was always in key stage two, but because um, my little girl is three, I feel like I'm just being opened up to this world yeah. um, and she's going to like school nursery in, in September. And I can understand actually, I'd never really thought about the transition from, you know, into uh, reception or out of reception. But if I think about the way that she's developed over such a short period of time, actually that is sort of, just more magnified, I suppose, than, you know, from 10 to 11, 11 to 12. It's yeah, and th this is something else that's fantastic about when you do work with children in early years is if you are teaching or working with a child who's three years old, that year they spend with you, taking them up to the age of four, is a quarter of their life. It's a quarter of their entire time. experience wow. of the world. It is literally 25% of everything they know has been potentially learned in that one year spell. So yeah. you kind of you are very responsible for a massive amount of shaping that child's future education and that child's future enjoyment of education. Now you're stressing me out a bit that <laughs> I'm going to the right school. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have um, looked into that. I yeah, do not yeah. doubt for a moment you'll have been I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be fine. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be fine. But yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's really a really good point. Um, okay, so what do you think makes EYFS different or special? I think if we go on to that point about the fact that it is such a huge proportion of the child's life, then that's one thing that's crucial and a key sort of aspect of it. Then you have also the fact that they spend, a lot of children spend such a long day at school mm -hmm. in comparison with the rest of their time that they're even awake for. Yeah. As children get older, they stay up a little bit longer, they have more mm -hmm. experience outside of the setting. Then you're kind of responsible for a massive amount of that child's education. And that's why I think it needs to have a little bit of a difference. It has a different curriculum, essentially. Yeah. When you start looking at um, the statutory framework for EYFS or when you start looking at the early learning goals, they are so broad and so different to what's in the national curriculum for Key Stage 1, Key Stage yeah. 2, that I think it kind of has to be different. And a lot of the best settings are the ones where the practitioners are just really knowledgeable and they can allow for children to explore themselves in like open-ended tasks more than you would get at really any age group. And there is an element where I would argue that, okay, Key Stage 2, what's stopping you from having a really open-ended investigation on at all times and having play-based work? And I've seen some settings where they do kind of learning outside of lessons and it works really, really well. So you can teach children to tell the time by just having a constant focus on what time of the day it is at that point, knowing the, for themselves what time they go for break and knowing sort of when the end of the day is. So they constantly are aware of the time and telling the time. You never then have to do lessons on it. Mm -hmm. But EYFS is kind of all that. Yeah. It's sort of, they're constantly learning. They're learning by communicating with one another. They're learning by seeing what an adult is kind of inputting with things. Mm -hmm. 
but you, oftentimes you can remove the adult from the situation and the learning doesn't stop. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what makes it different is that so much of their learning is in their experience as opposed to an adult really planning every last element of it. I know when I taught Key Stage 2, there was an awful lot of focus on it. It's something that's kind of changed a little bit now, but there was an awful lot of focus on doing an introduction. Mm -hmm. first part of your lesson and the dreaded mini plenary yeah. then the second part and then the last bit and what key vocab you were going to use and I know that's kind of been phased out or it's hopefully in most settings it's kind of gone but in EYFS it never happened yeah. it was almost like that that element never really came in um, there is a little bit of a trickle down effect happens where people start thinking well if you if you two are going to be more formal then year one have to be more formal and we need to get them ready for that in reception yeah. and I'm not sure that that's always the right way to go because what's happening in early years in nurseries and in reception is already great in most places. Mm -hmm. There's some fantastic things already happening and it'd be almost better to me if you pushed those up as opposed to having this trickle down effect. Yeah. So you did mention then about it there being quite different so you've obviously got your EYFS and then you've got uh, the curriculum in um, Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. How do you feel that fits together? Do you think it fits together or is it not, does it not marry up? I think it has to and I think more it would be better if more communication went on across different agencies and you had more multi-agency work between the sort of social work, the people who help out with transitions and the people who work in children's centres mm -hmm. across over into schools and integrated it more because you can kind of look at things like we're almost expecting children to start doing phonics. I read um, a piece about what, what comes before phonics, and I'm not going to remember the name of the writer right now, but I'm sure people can look it up. Can so it's what comes after when you told me. Good. So it's what comes before phonics, and it's this kind of look at the fact that, okay, you're going to start with these letters and sounds and things, and particularly in year one, because they do the phonics screening, you're going to teach them all these exact sounds, and then we expect children to contextualise that in a book and to read through it. And then there's almost like a pressure on reception and on nursery staff to really introduce reading at a much younger age and mm. as though that's the absolute antidote. And I think there's more to be said for early years doing more to prepare children for those things in terms of getting the communication skills right, mm. understanding kind of why people would want to write, why, yeah. why you would even have that as a communication tool, what you would explore in that. And there's things like encouraging children or having them make their own shapes and give meaning to them where you don't necessarily have to just constantly be saying, here's a book, here's how we read it, here's this sound, here's this sound, here's this sound. It's more about giving them a reason to want to learn to read. Yeah. The more you do that, the more you're going to feed into the things that come in Key Stage 1. So rather than having everything really formalised and really standardised, having children want to learn mm -hmm. and having them want to go into that more formal kind of education is what really matters. Because then when they do go into Year 1, they're actually going to be excited about the prospect of learning more and when they do move up through those year groups in school hopefully they're going to be enthusiastic that now they get now it's their chance they've they know why they're learning it they know the why of everything that yeah. is going to come now they get to see it as well yeah okay thank you um so obviously you're kind of heading up the new ER, eyfs resources that we're doing I am. um so how do you make resources for EYFS when obviously a lot of it is play-based learning and continuous provision? Like how do you decide what's a good resource? So, so having just told you about how everything needs to be play-based and open-ended, how do yes. I now tell you that you can give children Work specific sheets. resources and not worksheets? We're never saying <laughs> worksheets. Um, because you have them catered and planned properly because you have them open-ended, because you allow for them to be about exploration and allow for children to take it in their own direction. So I'll give, like a, I'll give a really simple example, which is if you had children sat around playing snakes and ladders and one of the children playing that game decides that they're going to tell you all about another time when they played a different game somewhere else completely, what you allow for is for them to go ahead and do that because they are showing you their own communication skills. They're showing you a little bit about their own understanding of the world and you don't structure a thing so that it has to be set in stone. You don't put in place real high structured things where you say, no, we're doing this now. Mm -hmm. You allow for them to wander off and to explore. And so when I've started making resources and planning resources, and I've worked alongside a lot of other early years practitioners, I haven't kind of just... In the company, yeah, you have yeah, um, Who've had a lot of input on this. Some of the things that we've looked at are catering the resources so that they can be changed, so that you're not just 
and when I say change, what I really mean is we have like at the moment we have sort of ten different versions of each one, mm -hmm. so that if you if you know some of the children in your class are just at that point in time really into dinosaurs, mm -hmm. then you can pick the one that is all about dinosaurs because it's going to get them a little bit more engaged because yeah. so. I'm, gonna, I'm forgetting all kinds of different people's names and things, but I can talk about a longitudinal study that went on in New Zealand, which looked at um, the best outcomes for children in early years and what caused that. One of which they found was the practitioner's knowledge, and another was just how engaged the children were mm -hmm. in what they were doing. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of studies that look at level of engagement in children and how vital that is. And this is one way in which you can make sure that it's more likely that children are going to be engaged by giving them something that they're already interested in and by allowing them the opportunity to finish something as well. Mm. Because one of the other outcomes of that same study was that the children who progressed the most were the ones who felt that sense of achievement, who knew they'd completed something, who knew they'd done something. So using that incredibly simple example of just a game of snakes and ladders, letting them finish the game instead of telling them, oh no, we're gonna move on from that now because we've got mm. something else to do. Sometimes that's really important yeah. Some, because they want to have achieved something, they want to get to that point where they finished and completed something. Mm. So a lot of what we've started creating are quite short activities, quite short tasks, and they're open to a lot of changes. So there's nothing to say that when we're presenting, say, for example, a, an activity where children can build their own number line and it's got lots of images on it for themselves, there's nothing to say they can't then decide, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to come back to that later or that they can complete it. It's, everything has to be open-ended. and everything centers around people knowing exactly what the activity is for so one of the things that we've also done is included sort of potential questions that you may wish to ask which mm -hmm. have been written alongside a lot of early years professionals as well so that everything's guided everything's the main thing has been planning that's yeah. been the vital kind of element of this is putting and allowing for hours to be put into making sure that things are right that not not one of the resources that we've made so far has looked at just one outcome. Yeah. They've all been really well-rounded because a good activity is. Because um, you don't want to miss something, do you, that they might be achieving? Yeah, exactly. Um, but we also sort of, you need to allow for the practitioners to have that level of professionalism and responsibility. So we're not kind of telling them, here's all of our ideas and stick to them. Mm -hmm. We're kind of allowing for, here's a load of ideas that you may wish to bring to this, mm -hmm. but we know you know the children better than we do. Yeah. So if you want to take it in a different route, do. We're giving you the choice of, you can use this if you like, here's how I would use it, here's how another teacher would use it, here's how this teacher might use it, here's how this, um, so my wife's an early years practitioner as well, and so she's sort of contributed a lot of these ideas as well, and a lot of them are different to what I would use a resource for, but fine, I think that's the best way to kind of be. Yeah, because it works for her, and I think one of the things that, that we talked about when we decided that we were going to do this is that often the guidance, it might not necessarily be for the teachers because they might kind of have all those questions that they're going to ask but it just helps them when they're going to pass it on to another member of staff as well. Yeah so I think it's important to offer them, the teachers might want to use them and that's great if they do yeah. but equally having worked in earlier settings I know that quite frequently you might have a student in or I mean even looking back to when I was like 16 myself and going into these places I really didn't know what it was that they were needing to get out of things so things like having key questions that you could ask or having a little observation sheet that you can fill out that's got lots of ideas all through it mm -hmm. would have been really useful to someone like me in that setting or could be really useful to someone who's a student, who's an NQT, yeah. who doesn't have as much experience and might they might have a perfectly good observation they find three or four things that a child has done, mm -hmm. all great, and there might be another few things that they've just not considered and mm -hmm. flagging it up in advance gives them that opportunity to kind of go, Absolutely, oh, I can look for this too. It's hard to remember everything. Isn't it's it? incredibly hard yeah. to remember everything and some of the best early years practitioners I've witnessed I've been absolutely in awe of because I know that I haven't myself been as anywhere near as good at them as they are at looking at what a child is doing and taking so much out of it. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just use one example that it's an activity I saw had nothing to do with me, I had no input in it um, and it was children using like a water tray outside. Mm -hmm. And what they had to do was fill, like on a scale, they had two things. So one side had weighted items in it and one side was empty and they had to try and get it to balance by adding water to it. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of different containers and the children doing that activity 
when I first went to it, this is very, very early on in my sort of journey into early years and looking at continuous provision, it looked like they were just causing chaos to me. Yeah. It just looked like there's water everywhere. They're just chucking water over. But then when asking the teacher afterwards, sort of what really was I looking at there, mm -hmm. the amount of things that they'd been able to draw from it was incredible because they were sort of saying, well, I wanted it to be open-ended, so, and then put in enhancements. So for one thing, they first showed how you would achieve something like this. And then on the following day, they removed all of the weighted objects. So the children knew that they had to place them in themselves. Mm -hmm. They were talking about the actual balance. They were talking about the capacity of the containers that they were using. On one of the days, the teacher put in some slightly larger containers so that the children were then telling each other, no, use this one because mm -hmm. this actually, this one's bigger. And they were using that kind of language, like talking about things that were bigger, talking about weights yeah. that were heavier, talking about different capacities and different objects and how you would find a balance in this. And the amount of things that that teacher, I'm probably doing them a complete disservice here because I can't remember half of the stuff that they drew from it. The amount of things that they took from that, that I would have missed was incredible. Just so much was brought out of that one single session that I would not have thought of. That I just think, yeah, you just have to sort of go hats off to some of them because it's yeah. it's amazing how you much you can get in one session. It, like yeah, wrote. you have to know it. And I've had to lean on the knowledge of some of the other staff that that you have at Classroom Secrets in, in order for me to... And we've even used external people mm -hmm. who've sort of come in and spoken to us about things that we may have missed yeah. because, okay, I've, I've spent a good while learning as much of this as I possibly can but that still doesn't beat someone who's done this for 15 years and knows it absolutely inside and out. And yeah, who's doing it day to day. Yeah. So you just mentioned learning and obviously you said before that you're doing a master's. You know, mm. what are you actually researching in your master's? Um, an awful lot of things. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of... So initially I was, I was looking at doing it mainly in creative writing is basically what I'm doing. And I anticipated that I was going to be doing things like writing novels, short stories. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done that. I've done more life writing and research and more writing up of little projects and writing up of research on early years and mm -hmm. that kind of area. So some of the things that I've kind of leaned on quite heavily, I mean, there's some really obvious things. There's like researchers like Bruner and people like that who any early years experts or any early years professionals listen to this will already know people like Bruner or Piaget and people like that. Mm -hmm. But then some of the more modern research that I've kind of looked at and also some of the blogs that I've been reading from other people mm -hmm. kind of collating that has been really interesting and there's certain ones that I wasn't overly aware of like um, there's Alistair Bryce Clegg who writes a fantastic blog on early years and excellence in early years um, so I've kind of been reading some of his stuff that's led me onto other areas that I hadn't anticipated ever touching on in this and that's kind of why I've ended up going from a position of saying I might go and do I've already done master's study before. Why I've chosen to do it again, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Um, it's just you, Lee. You just like education a lot. I do like education a lot, um, and I think, I think the more the more you learn, the more you realise you don't know. Yeah. And this is sort of something that, um, I mean, that's not a new thing. Confucius said that real wisdom is um, knowing your own ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that goes a long, long way back. People have known about this kind of thing for a very long time, that the more you learn, the more you realise you really don't know. Mm -hmm. And studying in this area has shown me that while I thought I knew loads about early years, I really don't. And that's kind of led on to me now deciding that um, September 2020 feels like a long way off now um, is when I'll start looking at doing a doctorate as well. And I think I know which area you're thinking about looking at, but what are you thinking about looking at? It would be early years. Um, there's, there's a project in Scotland at the moment which um, looks at the sort of age or age appropriateness of early years education. And I'd really kind of like to look into that more. Again, we're going to have to put this in the description because I'm just drawing a complete blank on what it's actually called. But it's, it's this current ongoing sort of push or movement towards the idea of starting education at age seven. Um, and so some of the top countries in Europe at the moment or in, in Western sort of education, mm -hmm. in literacy, I think Canada's top, in numeracy, Estonia's up there, in reading you have like, again, I think Canada and Estonia are kind of up there in all of them and a lot of the Scandinavian countries are there as well. And what links and merges all of these countries is the same thing. They all start actual formal education at age seven. Mm -hmm. So I kind of would love to look at 
what impact that has compared to what we're doing and why it is that we're choosing to do this because it's not even just Western. So if we think about what is changing in our curriculum at the moment, one of the big pushes is this move towards the Shanghai style of mathematics. And that comes because the, in PISA tests, and that's where I got the information for the Estonia and Canada thing as well, in PISA tests, the outcomes testing numeracy rates have sort of shown Shanghai to be up near the top and a lot of areas in China are up there and those kind of Asian countries are known for having these fantastic education systems. Mm -hmm. What never gets mentioned is that China starts formal education at age seven as well. Mm -hmm. And it seems to just be completely overlooked, yeah. this, this fact that actually even they don't start primary until then. They have like a kindergarten that's completely different, completely separate. Shanghai slightly earlier and a couple of the big cities, Beijing is as well, but it's still age six. Mm -hmm. It's not age four. Children aren't going off to school for the whole day at age four. And the most successful education systems pretty much across the board are the ones where children start their formal education at age six or at age seven. And I'd really love to look at why that is and what real long term impact we're having on children by going the way that we are, yeah. by having children learning at five. And what's already been done, what's already been studied in this sort of, in the Scottish studies is looking at the impact that we've had on children by introducing reading far too early, mm -hmm. or the impact that we've had on children. And th even, they go a little bit further in some of their studies in terms of long lasting impact that it has right on into adulthood right. on how much of a men mental well-being impact it is to put children in a situation of pressure mm -hmm. um, and I mean we already have enough research out there to show that there's different levels of uncomfortableness children show and so what is the benefit of giving a child a formal test if all they show is anxiety and resistance to it mm -hmm. how much are they getting out of that so I'd kind of really love to work towards a thesis in possibly the areas of what comes before phonics possibly the areas of what impact removing some of the formalization has on children at that age group and how much it alleviates pressure further on in school. So that. Thank you. So I just want to bring it round now. So you're, um, you're obviously a deep thinker mm. and you think a lot about uh, education and EYFS. So in your opinion, how, how could we improve EYFS in the UK? The most obvious answer is to improve funding and that's something that isn't an easy fix mm -hmm. because we know that there's been cuts across whole sectors of education but budget cuts in EYFS are having a massive impact. The more staff you have in there, the more adults you have in there, the better things will be and the better trained those adults are, the better things are going to be. So allowing adults to go on more CPD courses to, or to do more training, most of which has to be financed and funded, mm -hmm. has a massive, massive impact. Um, there's a book, um, When the Adults Change, Everything Changes, mm -hmm. that it looks, it's more for sort of higher up in a sense in that it kind of looks at impact of expulsions and sort of behavioural assessments on children and that kind of thing. But I just wonder how much better things could be if we could allow for more training and more research and just more funding in general. However, there's an obvious issue with that answer, which is that and it's not going to be that forthcoming, it's not going to be that easy mm. to implement um, extra funding and extra finance in these settings. I'm not sure how you kind of go about that. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to get through that barrier. But you did mention training, and there may be uh, some schools or teachers out there that are able to do that. I mean, and I'm, I'm guessing not everything is going to be need to be financed either. So what kind of training or reading or research you know, would you recommend? Because you've obviously done a lot of your own. Yeah, I suspect I'm going to have to sort of write comments when we eventually put this online to show... The show notes. Everything's yeah, I in the think show everything notes. in the show notes because there's an awfully long list of different researchers that I've looked at in advance of this. But in terms of things that people can do to improve their own practice that costs nothing, I think you can look at different educational blogs and you have to be careful because it's always someone's opinion or it's always one person's take. But I've already mentioned um, Alistair Bryce Clegg who does ABC Does. Mm -hmm. If people look up what he's done... He does offer conferences that are paid and things, but he also has a blog and he has guest bloggers on there who talk about a whole range of different areas of achieving excellence. And he does um, features on those transitions. I think he has a book out about it. I'm basically yeah. advertising a random um, early years expert here, but yeah. he, he is great and he's, he's influenced a lot of my thinking. Um, so I don't see any reason not to kind of, you know, pass on the fact that I've taken a lot away from reading about 
his different pieces and stuff. Um, there's nothing stopping people from constantly learning themselves. And you can join in with different little educational chats online. So if you go on Twitter, you can look for the hashtag EY Matters or EY Talking and have a look through because there are people on there who are educational consultants who charge for their own workshops, who charge and who sell their own books. And some of them are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like they are really great. But if you just don't have the budget for it, it's almost like a sort of free CPD tool to just read some of the things that they're talking about yeah. in there. Some of the areas that they're actually discussing can then lead you into reading your own research anyway. And one of the things that I'm going to look really nerdy now, as in case I don't already, but one of the things I tend to do is <laughs> I'll read some of the suggestions they make and then look just on something as simple as looking something up on Google on scholarly articles and see, OK, what's influenced their thinking? Where are they coming from with this? When they talk about a piece of research, I'll go and look it up and I'll read what actually was studied, what actually was looked at, what impact it had. And then that you can implement in your own practice mm. and it costs nothing. You can be your own researcher at all times. You kind of, if you're teaching in any manner, you're already kind of having action research mm. ongoing at all times yeah. because you take away something and think, oh, I'll try that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a go at that in my class. And being open to finding new things and being really open-minded to changing things and trying out different things, I think, is really important. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's been so informative. Um, do you think you would ever go back into teaching? Bearing in mind your boss is sat here. <laughs> <laughs> no, an answer how you want. Um, I'm just waiting to walk out any day now. I think All straight right. back into yeah. education. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really difficult. It's really difficult because I know what the workload was like yeah. when I worked in education before and I think I wouldn't want to walk back into something that was as challenging and as difficult as that mm -hmm. and go through that again. Things would need to be slightly different for me or I think I'd certainly I'd need to be a little bit healthier, that'd mm -hmm. help. But also I'm, I'm not currently feeling a desperate urge to go back teaching because at the moment I'm, I'm writing things in an area that I already have passion and love for anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm working on things that are to do with early years, which is the area I want to be in. I'm already doing a master's and I'm going to be able to go and create this thesis and push towards a doctorate in the same kind of area. I'm still kind of working on all of the things that I love while not teaching. So it's difficult. I'd possibly, if I was to go back into education, I'd question how much I was losing mm -hmm. by doing that because I'm already having or being that. able to have an impact anyway. Thank you. And, um, so as a company, we're quite big on life work balance. We've got a campaign. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you've been one of the ones who's helped me push that quite a lot. So if you could make, wave a magic wand um, over the UK, how would you solve the life work balance problem? I'd reduce paperwork. I would. What paperwork? Um, so when I did my PGCE, I had no idea what APP was which I know is gone now, but it stunned me when I first went into school and saw that we had to highlight off these statements. Mm -hmm. And when I said it's gone, it, it, it's almost like still kind of there in a different form. Mm -hmm. There's still such a requirement to evidence progress. There's still so much towards, and some of it's digital now, mm -hmm. and you may use different trackers to show progress. And there's almost a pressure, and I'm not exactly sure where it comes from, but there's almost a pressure of people feeling that if it's not, on paper mm -hmm. or if it's not evidence then it didn't happen and I think we have to take that away put more trust in the professionals that work with children and say that actually if they tell you that a child has done something mm -hmm. that child's done that thing yeah and, believe them. and allow for more trust to be there and I know you have to be careful and you have to look out for things but I honestly think overwhelmingly vast majority of people who work in education do so for the right reasons are honest and would rather have that pressure taken away and be trusted as professionals so that people can just say, has this child done such and such? Yes, they have, good. Yeah. No need to prove it because they have. And I think we see evidence of that all the time. So obviously we're in a lot of the Facebook groups and then when you've got people who say, oh yes, um, have you got any ideas for practical activities? And um, they'll get loads of ideas and then they'll come back and they'll say, you, yeah, I did that, but I still have to take a photo and I, I stuck mm. it in the book and then I still marked it. Yeah, there's, there's often that follow-up question of, well, how would you evidence that? And I think the evidence is that the child now has learned something. And can do this now. And can do this now. And yeah. maybe you don't always have to prove it. I just yeah. don't think it needs to be that way. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you some uh, quick fire questions now. So quick, snappy answers. Snappy, yeah. yeah. Uh, who was your favourite teacher and why? Um, I'd say it was Mrs. Field who taught me 
uh, Bradshaw Primary School. Uh, it was the sort of third school I'd gone to. I was always a bit unsettled and she was just a really calming kind of a teacher who was really softly spoken and did an awful lot of reading to us, a lot of storytelling and that kind of thing that was just, I found calming and relaxing. It's just... And yeah. fostered you for reading. That as well. Yeah. That as well. Um, what do you wish you'd known when you first started out in teaching? Just absolutely masses of things. Um, I've learned far more since doing my PGC than I ever did during it and I've learned far more through experience and I, I suppose in a sense that it's impossible to say that you would have been able to know any of those things mm. at the start of your journey into teaching but I think you just have to accept that you're going to keep getting better and yeah. you have to learn as you go. And I think just on that that's one of the really sad things about lots of teachers leaving um, it is. because they're kind of taking that experience with them and nobody's saying that you know NQTs and young teachers are great and they bring lots of enthusiasm but you're kind of removing the experience factor from a lot of schools as well. It's yeah. Such a shame. Okay, so what are the biggest changes, um, the three biggest changes that you've seen during education, during the time uh, you've been in it? Um, just, just in the time I've taught, there's been absolutely massive changes all through education. So it's if, if I'm only picking three, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd probably start off with the fact that the entire curriculum changed. Yeah. Um, which obviously has a massive impact. I don't know how much, because of when I qualified, it was like not long after I'd kind of started teaching really. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of knew it was coming from what I'd been told anyway, but I'm not sure how great or how massive the training was in place for people already in teaching mm -hmm. who suddenly had like this massive input on grammar, this huge influx on grammatical features and terminology that just wasn't essentially there at first. Mm -hmm. So the curriculum changing was a, massive massive change on just about everything and then just as they were kind of changing the entire curriculum they removed levels mm. which with very little yeah. to my knowledge very little kind of prior one and it was just suddenly okay here we go here's life without levels mm. um do whatever you want yeah um and i'm not sure there was really any preparation went into it i don't know how much you had training sessions or staff meetings where people were sitting around going what are we actually going to do and I don't know if that's kind of everyone's experience of it, but to me, I could have done with a lot more. I don't think many people knew at all, because I remember even at Classroom Secrets, there would be people who would contact us and ask us for the answers as if, you yeah. know, the government had contacted us to to send all the information out. And that just really wasn't the case. Um, and I had a chat with um, Heather McCavan, who's got Mrs. McTivity, about the same thing. And she kind of said the same thing, that nobody really knew what, we're going to do i think i think there's a similar sort of an ongoing one at the moment as well which is that there's currently a pilot study being done on early years that's going to potentially change all of the statutory framework for early years and unless you are one of those pilot schools then you probably won't necessarily know all the ins and outs of it and it's quite hard to find exactly what's going to, i mean it's a pilot so mm. they're not set in stone what the changes are going to be but that's suddenly going to be dropped onto people and you're going to have to react and change according to that so i mean changes to the curriculum, mm -hmm. changes to how you would level. And I'm, I don't think there's anything great about labeling a child as such and such an ability in whatever mm -hmm. subject or anything, but you do need an idea of what you're actually going to replace it with. You can't just yeah. panic everyone and yeah. kind of say, right, this is gone now. So mm -hmm. get on with something different. So I think those two changes and um, probably also just things like budget cuts and lack of finance and mm -hmm those kinds of things have just had a massive impact and like you've said about the whole kind of how many teachers are actually staying in the profession and how many yeah. are leaving and it ha it is just an ongoing change mm. that's been I think relatively unprecedented it's, it's massive and it's all kind of come at once yeah and it might also be why there's such a teacher retention mm. issue going on yeah possibly yeah um so where do you think that education needs to go in the next 10 years um I think we're going to have to, this is mainly UK based, I think we're going to have to find a lot of workarounds for things because if we're not massively increasing budgets then we're going to have to consider the fact that we have things like really ageing buildings, mm -hmm. we have schools that have been here since, I mean one that I've worked at which is near where we are now has been here since sort of a Victorian era and yeah. was designed to have one cohort that came in and learnt in the hall, now suddenly they're telling them that they could do with going to form entry and how can they build extensions on it and mm -hmm. 
we're going to have to find workarounds for things like that. Alongside that, you have issues with currently teaching things that are kind of already, and this is the nature of advancement in technology, kind of already outdated. Mm -hmm. So how do you teach children to be prepared for a world that isn't there yet? And I think we need to avoid expecting everything to be how it is now. Mm -hmm. So although we're teaching things like computing and coding, is that realistically going to be there when a child who's five now by the time they're looking at work moving into the the workplace and workforce is that really going to be there or are we better off harnessing their creativity and their passion and their own create ability to create things and look at things going that way because they'll be the ones creating it exactly that Mm. okay so who is your inspiration within education i don't know if naming just one sort of person is really a fair way of going about it um so i'll be slightly kind of lame here and say that anyone who has managed to stay in education stay working in education and keep that enthusiasm for it that they had Mm -hmm. since being a newly qualified teacher is worthy of that kind of praise and are the kind of people who i would look to and say yeah they're there that's amazing actually because i've thought about the question myself and thought oh if somebody asked me who would i say but that is really good point because i am absolutely in awe of people who stay in education particularly as well if they're full-time and then they've got young children as well it's just like i don't even know how they like manage to fit that together the balancing act of that and staying positive and staying upbeat alongside it i think it's just yeah it's it's like slightly amazing it's not even a tightrope it's like a piece of thread (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> they are walking along um okay last question then so what did you want to be when you grew up this is such a boring answer mm-hmm. um I, I i wanted to be a teacher i mean i could go really far back to when i was really really young and tell you that i initially wanted to be a circuit judge but that is entirely because and this is at about age four so i'm sort of sat in reception telling everyone i'm going to be a circuit judge entirely because there was a judge local to where I lived who lived in a massive nice house so I wanted to be so I told everyone I had no idea what a circuit judge was but I knew I wanted to be that and then yeah after that I kind of faded I knew I wanted to be a teacher and that was kind of all I ever wanted to be so thank thank you I um I've really enjoyed this chat and I think I think the listeners and people watching on YouTube are just going to find it really insightful um, especially if they're in EYFS. And I also think if it's, um, you know, if they're in Key Stage 2, I mean, for me, I did a lot in Key Stage 2. It's been really insightful for me as well to sort of see further down the school. And I think the more rounded we can be, the better we can we can teach across all your groups. I think so. Thank you.